right, so we are recording, and then I just like having a little bit of lead time on the stream itself. So that should be good. So we are streaming. Um, information updated. Uh, we are live. Uh, generally, there are like uh, two people in, so don't worry. It's, <laughs> it's basically me and you talking on a Hangouts call. Um, oh, that's cool. No worries. So, uh, interview 11, uh, not pretty but wonderful. Uh, <laughs> who are you? Uh, I'm Dennis Detwiller. Uh, I guess I'm most famous for Delta Green and um, other video games and Magic the Gathering I did some art for. And that's about it. Um, oh, that's sure. That's like the most deep cut undersell that I'm probably going to get for <laughs> like 40 people I'm going to end up talking to, but whatever. Sure. Why not? Um, so yeah, uh, Dennis, um, as I've told you in private, you are the first person whose name I was aware of in the business. Um, oh, cool. you're, well, I'm very you're, sorry. It's quite all right really you should be apologizing to my parents if anyone i'm fine with it um they probably are kind of mad about how much money i spent on uh delta green books and uh magic cards when i was a kid um yeah yeah it was it was a revelatory moment when i noticed your name was on a card that i had and also oh, on a cool. book um and cool. i was just like oh shit this is a this is like the this is per, a person this isn't this is a, <laughs> yeah. this is a human who made all the shit that i love right now um, yeah and you were you were in uh, new york i was in new oh, york yeah. um, did you go to the complete strategist is that I, you so shot? actually so i spent some time at the strat but i mean you, you know those guys uh not everyone yeah. will um curmudgeonly kind of just e even when they were younger old bastards um Classic. I'm like, great place. I love hunting. They they will have things from the 1980s that they just never moved and are just like yeah. hidden behind boxes on a shelf. Um, no, when I was there, I don't know if it was, it was, when did you leave New York? 92? Okay, 92, so uh, neutral grounds on 26th between 6th and 7th? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so neutral grounds was open, I want to say like by 94, 95. Right, um, right. And it was on the fourth floor of a building just down the street from FIT, um, which, what, what SVA campus were you at? East or we, West? Uh, so uh, first, second, third year I lived in uh, Jersey City. Oh, okay. Uh, the Jersey City apartments. Yeah. And then uh, last year, I think I was at the, the Y, I don't even remember. Okay. Um, the last year was not a good year. Um, but anyway, uh, FIT, yeah. I yeah. Mean, so, there, so. Um, yeah, I don't even know how I found. There was like a shitty little store on 57th between 8th and 9th that mm -hmm. was there until I was like 6 or 7. And then Neutral Grounds was like the only place that I bothered going to. Um, right. Because they had like a whole floor of a building, so unlike the Strat, which you couldn't play anything in. Oh, oh no, yeah, I um, mean, you get kicked out. Like, yeah, you sit in the middle of an aisle um, and play. Whereas, like when I was a kid, what my parents would do instead of sending me to camp is they would give me twenty dollars and be like, buy a frozen pizza and however many magic cards this gets you, <laughs> and like just don't like don't wander off. Um, yeah, and we'll it was see kind you. of different when I was a kid, but yeah, I mean similar go here's money go do something yeah standard um but yeah i started playing magic when i was five so that would have been 94 Jeez. um holy crap and i was introduced to delta green the same year wow so, so you weren't kidding about being a little kid no i was like a baby it was like me at a table at neutral grounds with like <laughs> four 40 year old like neck beard long hair metalhead dudes <laughs> Um, in like just like Slayer shirts covered in dandruff, um, like yeah. talking about like trade craft um, <laughs> and things like that, and me just being like, yeah, I shoot the Cthulhu monster. Um, <laughs> That's totally crazy. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's surreal. Like magic is beyond surreal to me because it's like it's like we had a song. It's like if you had a song in high school that you and your friends would sing, and it became like a marginal local hit. And then you kind of wandered off the scene and 25 years later, you turn on the TV and like 
the VP of advertising for some giant company is singing the song. And you're like, what the hell is going on? What is... It just yeah. keeps going, yeah. right? Like, How does it end? It, it, it's it's insane. And, and they still mail us these tiny little royalty checks. Really? And I'm the bane... Oh, yeah. And I'm the bane of... There's a woman at Hasbro, and I'd like to apologize to her. She's a wonderful old lady named Jackie. And Jackie, I love you. Thank you for hunting me down every time I move and go, you know, where the hell do you live now? It, it was returned. The 15 cent check was returned, and I have to get it to you. So I, I'd like to apologize to her. I'm surprised. She's really good at her job. I'm surprised they don't just like buy you out for a crisp 20 or something. They, they can't. Um, I mean, part of the, I mean, there, there's been some talk of that, but they, they, the contract that was written for the original magic sets for the artist was the greatest artist friendly contract in the history of all mankind. Okay. And uh, I, I, I bless the gods that it ever came to be. And I ever came to be a part of it. How, what is that just Atkins being like a mensch or what? No, it's Jesper, Jesper Mirfors. Okay. Uh, so Jesper, I don't know if you know Jesper, he did uh -huh. some art for the unspeakable oath. And... Okay. So I hired Jesper to do art for some of our early pagan game books, uh, cool. Devil's Children and other things like that. Okay. Um, so he became a friend and then he, you know, said, oh, I'm working on this card game with these two weirdos in Seattle and you want to do some <laughs> cards. And that's how I kind of ended up there because uh, John Tynes and myself were friends with Peter mm -hmm. and Richard kind of passing. Um, but Jesper uh, is the ultimate like art, art, artists need to own their work kind of guy. And I've learned a ton from him. But basically, he marched out there with this contract that was just incredibly artist friendly, um, and it it just it it just uh, put me on the right track in life as far as obsessing about ownership of my own artwork. Um, it became kind of a principal central theme in my creative life. Is I want if I'm making something I really believe in, I need to own it. Um, Fair. And that, yeah. Was so. that was that true? So this is this is post you moving west yeah. to do pagan stuff mm -hmm. um so one i want to hear the story of like exactly how does like an sba kid in new york like <laughs> figured like go i'm gonna move to do weird rpg shit for like a small company uh, out west well i um so I, I was at sba and i was doing um pro work so i was i was doing um uh it's utility inking which is like inking no one wants to do that's what at, my at that's Marvel. that's what my mom did at Marvel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was it it was it was the people were awesome, but the place was just not that great. Yeah, and all my all my idols were being slowly kind of weaned off of staff jobs and fired. Um, and this this guy Robert Budiansky, Bob Budiansky, who did um, Ghost Rider mm -hmm. and the Transformers, really great penciler. Just basically told me one day, like breaking into comics in the '90s is like trying to break into Auschwitz or something. Like, go, go do something. It's like go, it's like go do something else. Like, you're you're, you're, sem you're semi talented. You you can paint pretty well. Just go do anything else. Um, and and it was totally true. It was like I watched the industry just kind of collapse after that. Um, and then when I when I ended up at Wizards and people at Marvel found out, I got like a half dozen phone calls from names who I will not repeat who were like, oh, you got any of those magic cards? Can you hook me up? <laughs> and, you know, like because they had heard stories, right? Like yeah. blowing up. Um, so so anyway, uh, I was doing this utility work for Marvel and DC and a couple other companies and um, it wasn't paying very much and I couldn't sure. stay alive. And my parents were just done with me because, um, I, I, you know, I was a really troublesome kid and didn't get along with anybody and just kind of wanted to do my own thing. Um, and then I went, uh, I was dating a girl. I almost married. Uh, went, uh, I was in New Brunswick, New Jersey. She went to Rutgers. Okay. And so I was there, wandered into a game store and I saw on Speak Below 3, okay. which is the, the Uncle Fester cover. It's mm -hmm. like three cultists with inverted onks. And, mm -hmm. and I was like, that's my jam. I don't even know what that is, but I'm going to buy that. And and within a day, I had written a letter to John saying, yeah, I'm an artist, and, and uh, you guys have an open call for artists, so do you need any art? And he was like, oh, God, yeah. So I just started sending him art, and he started printing art, and he started sending me assignments. And it was fun. Um, and me and John got along, and we'd talk on the phone and kind of uh, freak out about what we wanted to do in gaming. And, it, you know, it was a, it was sure. a real uh, – but basically, the impression I got from them is they were running kind of like a frat house 
for gamers yeah. in Missouri. And then he started telling me about like prices in Missouri. And I was living on first, I was on first Avenue at the time and it was, you know, I was paying thousands of dollars sure. in rent and, you know, and Columbia was like, you want, <laughs> you want like a four level Victorian mansion for that much money. Yeah. Um, and going to a bar and all these, you know, it was all, so I took all my money that I'd made for like five and a half months, mm-hmm. live with my parents, made cash, and then just said, I'm going to live out in Columbia, Missouri for like a year and change on this before I even have to touch it sure. yeah. like, and, and go back to it. So, and John, you know, they had this giant house and they were losing a roommate. So I just kind of flew out there on a whim and just didn't come back. Um, and that, that was it. Uh, we just started making game books like immediately. Uh, it was great fun. Uh, the, the pagan house was, I can't really even explain it now. It was just a very strange place. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I've heard like the vague edges of retellings and it definitely, it sounds like a frat house if you just put a bunch of nerds together in it. Um, yeah, yeah, it was very nerdy, um, yeah. but, but you know, in the best possible way. Sure. Um, so, so we play Call of Cthulhu all the time. We play Dungeons and Dragons sometimes, sometimes Roll Master or something like that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, crazy, oh. crazy ancient games. And, you know, it was great. We watched movies and, and just kind of let ideas germinate and argue about scenarios and stuff like that. And that's kind of where all, like, Delta Green and all that kind of stuff came from. Was okay. just us hanging out. Yeah, just shooting the shit. Yeah, and, you know, oh, would it be better if we could do this? And, yeah, you know, it just it congealed, and we were the right people at the right time and the right place. It was uh, John Tynes, uh, Blair Reynolds, mm-hmm. uh, Brian Appleton... Uh, John Crow the Third, um, Jeff Barber, uh, and then later Adam Scott Clancy, and it was just kind of like being in a band or something. Like I, I imagine, I've never been in a band. But <laughs> so, so one thing that I've, I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said always because when I was five, I definitely didn't have this thought. But like for a while now, one of the things that I've wondered is the realities of publishing a book have yeah. pretty dramatically changed over oh, yeah. time, right? I I have probably been only in this industry for, I don't know, six years now. Yeah. Um, and even in that time, it's it's a world different from oh, what yeah. it was. Um, you, you're looking at, like, the early 90s to now, and there, there's almost no comparison. Shit, I just drew a pencil mark on my wall. <laughs> whatever. Don't wildly just... You're not going to get that deposit it, back. Yeah, no, that's whatever. That's a few hundred dollars gone. Um, so... You're living in this house, and yeah. it's just kind of a bunch of, I don't know, idiots making games together, having fun. Yeah. Um, how do you go from that? And, like, you're do- Oath is being done, right? But Oath is yeah. a zine in a very traditional yeah. I mean, it, some of the issues are quite thick for what we think of as zines, um, but they're, they're zines. Um, oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. How do you go from that to, like, an offset print run back when it wasn't just like hit upload pdf and drive through prints yeah we we kind of tiptoed into it so we did grace under pressure was kind of the first staple bound okay. uh color cover book thing we did and we then we did another book called alone on halloween uh, okay scott angelowski it's like a choose your own adventure kind of one player called cool thing okay. and that was kind of four process cover so we were kind of tiptoeing there john had great interest in graphic design um you know he was doing layout and stuff like that he really liked that uh, and i was really into art direction and kind of art and you know less about writing at the sure. time but i was getting into writing i, I had yet to really even write a story at, at that point um so uh the big jump was a book called uh, walker in the wastes okay so so walker in the wastes was a classic call through book just mm-hmm. a giant you know, really big for us, 280 pages or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, the truth be told, that took years and uh, two years, something like that. And, and then to get it printed is like you, you literally send it to people who photograph each page yeah. you know, with the artwork pasted yeah. on it. And then that's, you know, those negatives are sent to some printer and we get test prints and it took forever. And, and literally now it's like, I'm going to go make a book, me. Like, I just, I'll paint the cover and I'll write the book and, you know, hopefully someone will edit it and then we'll just send it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, hell, I'm on your Patreon, right? Like I, 
I have seen you been like, hey, this is the draft of something. Like, uh, if anyone catches any uh, spelling errors, please let me know. Um, it's, it's such a huge help, and it's cool. Like, the people, the people get excited to kind of be involved, and they bring these great bits of feedback I never would have considered. Why don't you write more about Henry Tudor? Why don't you do this? And I'm just like, oh, that's, that's a great idea. Fuck. Like, yeah. You know, and then I'll... So it's, it's a really... I can't state strongly enough that this is the golden age right now to create and sell your own RPG stuff. There's literally, there's no they preventing you from coming in. If you, if you bleed into the book and you get it printed, there's a high likelihood you will be nominated for some award and maybe win one. There's no, there's no like secret cabal keeping you out. Uh, Unlike comics or, you know, publishing or, Mm -hmm. Like, seriously, publishing is a terrifying thing. You know, who's your agents and which yeah. house are you going with? There's all these secrets that go on. There, there's no one running the show at TTRPG. It's yeah, just, I mean... They just kind of happen. It's easy to forget what, like, the DJA doesn't exist until, like, 2000, right? Like, the Annies yeah. don't exist until, what, a couple of years after that. So yeah. these are things that, like, we take for granted as, like, as old as the hobby. And it's like, there was yeah. literally what the origin words. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean... Yeah, yeah, the Origins Award was it for, yeah. for many, many years. Um, but, but saying that, you know, it's easy. It's easy to say that. Um, well, what I wish I could do is when I talk to you, you know younger people working on this stuff, is show them what it was like in 1992, and they would just run back, you know, hug their tablet and give it a kiss, and, you know, um, because it's changed so much. I mean, it, it, it's and and you know, Patreon and Kickstarter and all these things sure. have made it completely possible to just control uh, your direct connection to your audience and it can be as vibrant and as cool as you kind of want it to be um, and you know a lot of people have trouble kind of I won't say self-selling but you know putting themselves out there they're I mean, I think self-selling is honestly an even more accurate description because this is a thing I see a good deal right which and and mm-hmm. if you're Sorry, I think I'm actually getting feedback. I just noticed. Uh-huh. Uh, hmm. All right. Well, whatever. That'll get edited out. Um, if you're active on Twitter, right? Or I guess previously G plus or yeah. before that, like RPG that or whatever, like any of the online platforms um, where the industry in some part lives, um, mm-hmm. you see a lot of people who are very comfortable putting themselves out there, but they're not comfortable selling their stuff. Right. Right. Um, and it's, it's well, because like I fall into that, but I, I occupy this weird space where I don't really make things. I just exist knowing people and like connecting people. Like I just, I make friends by going to cons and introducing people who make things to other people who make things. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm fine existing in the space where I can I can talk about myself and I can right. be a person and be a public persona, um, but I don't sell shit, so I don't have to be comfortable selling shit. Right. Well, I mean, it would be much harder to sell. You know, I can see the downside to selling shit if you secretly believe what you're producing is kind of substandard shit. Sure. So that you know, that's got like not you personally, but like in general. Yeah. Uh, you know. You know, like. There's a lot of people just kind of pressing the five E button and mm-hmm. going like, "Give me the money, you know." Please. Yeah. Um, so I can see how it would be exhausting to go up there and go like, you know, Adventure X features killer elves, and so, you know, like. Um, but I genuinely love what I'm making. Like, to, I wouldn't make it mm-hmm. if if I didn't like absolutely fall in love with the making. Um, and you know, if I ever stop falling in love with stuff, and it has happened, I just it goes on the pile and I just move on. There's a, there's a come to come to Cthulhu moment where I'm just like, this is it. I'm like chuck it over the shoulder and let's move on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can see where you're coming from. You, you seem, you seem like you're in the crossroads of the creative endeavors here. Like, you know, everybody, like I've, I've seen you talk to, you know, like, Hey, everybody. Um, but I think you could sell, I mean, this is interesting. Um, you could definitely sell yourself. Yeah, I I can sell myself. I just can't sell my stuff. And that's, it was that's too bad. Yeah, it was interesting doing the little marketing work I did for this Kickstarter mm-hmm. because I could like shit post about it, no problem. Right. 
And that right. was essentially the best I could do for marketing because if you tried to get me to sincerely pitch the product, uh, <laughs> it was like pulling my own teeth out with a plier. Yeah, um, you have to you have to feel comfortable doing it. You yeah. Know? Um, but but so many so many of like the young the younger designers I see like there are a couple of people who just stand out. Spivey is one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, he just he's kind of a natural and like I'm gonna sell this but at the same time it's fucking cool so you want it um there's a lot of people like that actually uh but you know it's things have changed so dramatically like in the in the late now like the thing if you know delta green Mm -hmm. you know now that me and john and scott made absolutely no money off of delta green like negative money like we barely stayed alive we basically paid our rents and and then someone else walked away with gobs of money because it sold very well through distributors who never paid us um so that's what it was like back then and now it's much better so okay i'm trying to there are two questions i have immediately i'm trying to figure out which one i want to go with first um the history is more interesting to me personally so i'll go with that one how how do you not just stop when that happens right um i mean you with oh, somebody you mean, else walking away with all this money you basically being left just eating shit we kind of did we kind of did stop i mean don't we released so so to give you guys an idea we worked for five and a half years on delta green countdown maybe six years from front to back and and to be fair it was a 400 and something page book yeah it was, it's a monstrous book and we charged 40 dollars for it it should have been 60 dollars mm-hmm. um and, and people complained. They were still like, how dare you give us three books yeah. for the cost of two books? Yeah. Um, so that was a little bitter bitter pill right there. But then that was immediately followed by uh, Wizard's Attic, which was a very big distributor at the time, literally selling us, selling all of our stuff and then just the, the owners absconding with all the money. Yeah. It wasn't just us. It was tons of companies. No, I mean, that but was just, one of the biggest events of the D20 bust. Oh yeah, it was it was a very very. I remember the day and I remember what happened and I remember just freaking out. So it was a bitter, horrible feeling. But the truth is, we did all kind of walk away. John was like, eh, "I don't want to do this anymore, and I'm going to go work at Microsoft." And I was like, "I'm going to Vancouver. I'm you know I'm, I'm getting married. I'm going to do video games." And, and Glancy just kind of stayed where he was, and and he met his wife, and they kind of stayed in the old pagan house. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the truth is it did break us up pretty significantly. Um, you know, it's really shitty. It's just a really bad feeling to kind of pour your soul into something for so long and then be told it's amazing. Yeah. And, and while simultaneously making nothing from it and being told you're charging too much money for it. Yeah. And it's just like it's the, we all just kind of threw in the towel and kind of walked away. At the same it's time. the ultimate for exposure moment, right? Um, yeah, it, it was horrible. Yeah, I mean, and for reference, I paid three hundred dollars for my copy. Oh, Jesus. so I'm really sorry. It's fine. It was a, uh, it was a mint condition one. I pulled the trigger on that oh. in a heartbeat. Um, that's <laughs> not even the most I've spent on an RPG. That was an easy purchase for me. Oh, um, well, I'm glad. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I, it is uh, still in shrink on my shelf. Um, <laughs> um, that, oh, that's never coming out of the shrink um, so yeah I'm enjoying it in my own way oh, um, okay, good. okay so I guess the other question is for all the ways that things have improved right and this is probably the one thing that I've seen you get the most pushback on in like mm-hmm. online spaces sure. is I think there there is a way in which pointing out the kind of material benefits that have accrued to the designer in mm-hmm. the ways making games and putting them out has has become easier in some pretty big ways. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, comes off as that's okay. To... You don't have to defend my feelings. Um, no, I'm just thinking of the right words here. This is, uh, <laughs> this is going into print at some point. It's the least I oh, can yeah. do. Um, I don't know. It, it comes off as a little patronizing, right? If, and, and I don't think that's the intention. And I think that's, um, I mean, who knows? I don't want to speak for you. Who knows? Maybe you are trying to be patronizing. Um, but I don't think so. Uh, 
I, I about half the time I'm not trying to be patronizing, okay. and the other half it's in response to someone snarking up. Sure, but I mean, truth be told, um, it infuriates me uh, to a certain degree. So I may be, over, I may be reacting poorly to these these interactions. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, I won't say I'm an exceptional people person. So, no, but you're uh, also like, I know some real vicious pieces of shit in this business. Y- oh, you're yeah. not one of them. R- right. Like, I hope not. I, 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 no, no, no. I, 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 I would tell you if you were. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Um, and it, I, what I will say is that um, I, when I hear I, – what, what I hear a lot of is I can't do this because of X. Mm-hmm when they're posting from a computer, when they're, you know, they literally could just, I, you know, they, it, the truth is they, it's really hard, not they, but it's really hard to make something. Sure. And it's always going to be hard to make something to a certain degree, but the, the execution of having made something has become infinitely easier. So I have the, the idea, I have the, the, you know, I can put it into a box and sell it mm-hmm. in a single step. That, that step used to be a year of our life mm-hmm. uh, of six people working 24 hours a day trying to get this thing out. So, you know, I often think what would happen if the Pagan House happened today? Mm-hmm. And, and the truth is it would be probably two or three years of just unprecedented amounts of products. And then we would burn out and kill each other. Mm-hmm. But, but it would be really cool during the, you know, the pre-burnout phase. Um, so what I worry about is that people look to this market as this impenetrable they Mm -hmm. it's it's this it's this thing outside of myself and i hear that a lot i hear that a lot and it's just not it it is literally you and if you make a good book like i've seen so many new weird cool little books just come out of nowhere and immediately rise to the top of holy shit have you seen this and you know i i want everybody to take their shot i think it's important um, but a lot of people, they, they don't want to put their work out there. They're really afraid. So they kind of work on excuses. Um, that's become very popular. And it may, it may have been very popular in the past, too. I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm just saying they had a decent excuse, which was, this is going to be a year of my life to get this book into print. When you literally go export PDF now and you're ready. Um, I mean, it may suck, but you're ready. So I will, I will give you a momentary pushback on that. Um, sure. But it's from a different angle. So just okay. take that. I, I do not consider myself a producer. I said okay. that. I consider myself, I don't know, an archivist. I'm fascinated by the history of the business, right. of the products that have come out over time, of like the weird little sidesteps that people have taken that have arrived at unprecedented moments. Um, in the past few years, I've observed a flourishing of output that I can only call unprecedented. Oh, totally. Which is marvelous in a lot of ways, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But for the first time, and I remember the moment this hit me was a few months into itch.io becoming like a legitimate competitor to drive through and mm-hmm. what we ended up terming the lyrics game scene kind of blowing up and realizing like the pace that people are putting things out is so fast that like i'm spending six hours a day buying and reading through games just to stay abreast of what's going on <laughs> yeah. just to know yeah. the names and what the hell the ideas are that people are working with um yeah and sure, they're selling for $2 a pop, and you can put it together in an afternoon in some cases, right? Not not that they right. were. I've seen some of these games go through month-long processes. Um, no, no, I know, I, know, I know what you mean. I'm not undervaluing this, sure. those little games. Some um, of those little games are magic. Yeah. So, you know. But in that environment, right, like in, in this unprecedented blooming of productivity, um, I can see a different type of stressor emerging than what was known, but it's no less real a stressor, right? Before it was, this is a year of my life, Mm -hmm. but if I get it out and it doesn't suck, 
the chances are pretty good that someone will notice it. Now it's, this might only take me a couple of weeks, but who knows if, you know, we're going to have as many Newton Leibniz moments, right? Both yeah, arriving yeah. at calculus at the same time. Who knows if in that two weeks my, my, my brilliant insight is done three other times because somebody, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, but that's, that's a classic art conundrum. Sure. I mean, that sounds like, you know, it's, it's pretty much every TV show, every book, like there's unprecedented amount of TV shows. There's an unprecedented, like, it, it, the genie's never going back in the bottle unless we lose like three quarters of the human race, sure. it, it, you know, which, you know, truth be told is a possibility. Um, yeah. It's a little scary, but it could happen. Um, you know, but looking at that, you know, I, I'm not sure I would want it to go back. I, I love looking at these little games. I love looking at the bigger little games mm -hmm. that, that scare me because they're so cool and weird. And you're just like, Holy crap, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, I need, I need those in my life. So I'm happy if there's tons of them. And, you know, you get a little, it's it's like music, right? Music sure. is, yeah. you know, there's a billion bands. And, and I guess you know, it, my point wasn't so much that I want it to go back, because I don't want it to go back either, right? right. I think it's it's a net positive to have this change. Um, but it's much harder. But it's it's much harder in a different way, right? And I think mm -hmm. that that might be the only time I ever kind of see you go off on somebody. And I'm generally in agreement. Like, I get the point you're making. But every now and then you kind of... I think it's, you allied over the fact that just because the old differences aren't there, new ones haven't emerged. Oh, oh no, I, I, I see your point entirely. Okay. So I, I just like to say 100%, I kind of, I agree with what you're saying, but at the same time, the only solution to that problem, the only existing solution is just not to try. Sure. There's no other possible solution. Sure. It's either you take your shot and you hope for the best and, and luck and time and, and tide lines up to kind of land it in Ken Height's lap and he'll shout about it on sure. some podcast and suddenly everybody will be playing it or it just doesn't do anything. And, I, you know, I've released games that just didn't do anything. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it bums me out. Godlike is one of those games. I love Godlike. I, I bled into Godlike. It was the pagan game. We all worked like bastards and it was just kind of like, eh. Um, I mean, it did okay. It, it got nominated for a bunch of stuff. Didn't win anything. It mm -hmm. sold well, but it wasn't what I wanted it to be. Sure. Um, so, you know, you take your shot and move on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would encourage all the people trying really hard right now. The, looking at the odds is going to just bum you the fuck out. Yeah. You know. So I agree that there are, there are new challenges. Okay. Um, um, but the other thing I will say is that you can gather a fan base so much easier now and that fan base can literally be five people yeah it, it doesn't matter you have people you can bounce stuff off of mm -hmm. that's that's magic you can make great things based mm -hmm. on kind of getting everybody around a, a fire i'd actually say more than anything i more than the ease of, of creating new products i'd say that's actually what i would attribute the blossoming productivity to is mm -hmm. just like these ever expanding circles of five people um, yeah, yeah. Where, I mean, like, it's magic. Yeah, I, I, I look at any number of people that are that I'm going to be interviewing for this, or people that I knew, right? Like, I go, I go. Uh, how do you how do you get to uh, the modern lyrics game movement, right? You you can right. and you can trace that back, and it goes like at a certain point you go. Uh, John Harness uh, is roommates <laughs> with Darcy Ross, and Darcy Ross knows Ken Height. Uh, right. And Darcy also ends up working for MCG. How does Darcy work for MCG? Because Darcy is part of the, like the super fans network yep. of Gen Con and like does some game running stuff for them. And it's just like these concentric rings of people who just have three or four people they like and just they get in and they get in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I love that. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of how I, I look at it. I, I definitely agree with what you're saying. Though. I mean, but the bigger thing, for me is what a time like this this is this is just magic now you can make yep. you can make what you want and you can change people's minds and let them have fun in new and interesting ways uh and that that you know i think a lot of what gets lost and what a lot of what upsets me is that often people go too far carrying their their kind of their luggage they want to throw it onto the gamer when in actuality, what you're doing is helping someone play pretend. 
you're helping someone escape their life and kind of live somewhere else for a short time mm -hmm. in their mind. And, and I try and keep that kind of centered when I'm writing this stuff or drawing or whatever. I want to scare people, but at the same time, I want to Delta green is all about learning what being a human is because it's going away. Mm -hmm. um, and I really want to, you know, hit that. So when I talk to new people in the hobby and stuff, and, and they're like, I'm having trouble kind of getting this product out there. I'm like, what's the hook? What's the name? Why do people want to play it? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people haven't even considered that kind of stuff when they started writing their game. And that's a lot of, a lot of traction comes from those really simple tasks. And I was just talking about it on Twitter today and people were, you know, generally pretty cool about it. Sure. Uh, yeah. But you know, 95% cool and 5% freaking out. As if, if you're hitting those ratios, you're doing something yeah good you're doing something right um but it's not just like 90 it's not this flipped right it's not five percent good and 95 percent coming for your blood um, oh don't you know don't don't get me wrong i've had those posts as well but, yeah but you know in general yeah it, it's been pretty positive so okay so again i two two directions i could take this um so you talk about getting excited right and i think this is a this is an important thing for anyone in any creative field right if you oh, yeah. lose the excitement for what's coming out you're just going to become disconnected and you're gonna fall by the wayside you have to you don't have to stay abreast of everything but you kind of right. have to maintain an interest yes. um how and this is this is just a question for you personally right it's not an advice uh -huh. question for the world um how do you personally reconcile i mean you've you've been working in coc basically oh yeah for mm -hmm. uh in what 27 years now yeah something like that. um and i know you do get excited about these things right we've talked about oh, indie yeah. games and, and shit like that since i first met you and we had our first conversation like five years ago yeah. um and yet you still work in COC. Like, what is that process like? Is it is it the familiarity of it that allows you to do new things within, or, or what is it? No, I, I think it gives, when it's run properly, it gives the most satisfying out outlay of emotional success. Interesting. It, fe it, fe it feels the best to me. This is just a personal thing. Sure, Not, yeah, yeah. No, totally. It's, you know, um, to, to try and to possibly succeed it, it, despite these incredible odds and to barely pull it off, even if your character dies, is the best feeling in an RPG I've ever had. And I've played thousands of sure. RPGs, like, at, you know, um, and it just find myself coming back to that again and again, because it, it is what it is to, to be human. It, it is all about the striving for something else and, and never quite making exactly where you want to get. You never quite. Kick sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. You barely yeah. survive. And that's like, that's a story you'll tell for years. Remember when John barely survived the thing in the, you know, so that's what I love about it. And I always find myself excited by it. And there's always a new thing to do in it. Now, I guess the, the immediate follow-up is that, is that a function of the system itself or of the genre of storytelling? No, it's, I wouldn't even say the genre. It's a, it's a function of the, I, I, I honestly think it's because the universe portrayed in Call of Cthulhu, barring the Cthulhuoid elements, is our universe. Um, sure. I, so it's, a, it's an escape, it's, a, it's kind of the ultimate escapism, especially Delta Green. You're it's escaping you're into the real world. Yeah, you're, you're playing a, an, a, you know, an analog to yourself <laughs> in a place you recognize that has all, you know, I have a cell phone, it's not cyberpunk it's not why second life feel, worked yeah you feel a visceral connection to the world so when the weird stuff pops out it feels even more weird and cool sure. or at least that's my that's my theory this is all just me sure yeah um but i've never looked at a page i've never been told oh we need a new scenario for Delta Green, and looked at a page and gone what am i going to do now i've never ever felt that way sure and um, i mean I'm there like, are a lot of them Right, yeah. like you had your collective output has been, um, I don't know. It's it's not quite at the like uh, Gygaxian era D and D no. levels, but like for the number of people who have worked on it, you've put out a shit ton. 
Yeah, oh yeah. And we're and we're you know, there's a, another shit ton coming very shortly. We're currently in the midst of three big books. Yeah. Um so yeah, you know, the, that's the way I look at it. I love other games. I mean Godlike and Wild Talents. I wanted to do a superhero game, mm-hmm. so I did that. Um and you know, it has shares some sensibilities, but it's kind of its own beast. Mm-hmm. Um uh, you know, and, and me and Shane have been batting around an idea of doing a dark fantasy based on the Delta Green rule set. Okay. So like a, a prehistory uh, Conan style. Would you, you – know. so now I, I immediately have to know, like, so BRP obviously has been used for, like, COC and fantasy, right? Everything from yeah, Stormbringer no, this, and this, – This would be our own – this would be the Delta Green system with okay. modifications. So, okay. So um, it would, you know, it would have – uh, bonds it would, sure. it would you know it would basically be what what i want what i really miss and what I, what I, when i play 5e we, I've, and i've been playing 5e for years now mm-hmm. i really what i really want is like you know he turns on you and beheads you in a single stroke and sure you're screwed or you read the book and you know you shrivel to dust and you know some horrible thing yeah i mean boil out of your body. what uh i would i would say what draws me to a lot of games that we would consider osr right if we could if we could drop the yeah. label and the baggage that it has sure. the reason i prefer playing dcc to uh mm-hmm. like 5e is because that yeah. shit can happen oh yeah yeah totally and you know i just i i just kind of want to bring a darker sensibility to fantasy i mean swyhander kind of does it uh warhammer kind of does it i love warhammer i love you know sure. don't get me wrong i mean it's the just mechanically it's not exactly what i want i'm Fair. very picky yeah um so. is that kind of what the 5e modules that you've you put out what three of them now yeah yeah shane's written those and and i i'm in love with those modules okay. shane just did a fantastic job of kind of doing this kind of bronze age mm-hmm. dark magic stuff i will um, say i have them all i just haven't read any of them yet no no worries i'm sure no. you got a lot of stuff to read um, but yeah, no, I mean, that, that was just kind of Shane. Shane was interested in not burning his brain out on Delta Green. I've never had that problem. Sure. Shane was in the midst of like balance, you know, editing three books and writing two scenarios. His brain was going. So he was like, I'm screw it. I'm just going to write D and D modules until my brain's clean. Uh, and it worked. So, um, anything that gets Shane back editing my work is always a really good thing. Fair. So. So flipping, okay, so uh, this is going to be kind of a weird one. That's okay. Say you come into like a a million dollars tomorrow. Yeah. And you got to split it up, you know, five ways, 10 ways, 20 ways, whatever. You got it. But it's for projects that you want to see funded. Okay. That you don't necessarily want to be the person to do, but like you'd love for them to exist. Right. Um, what like you've said spy v and yeah. like i get it right like i yeah. spy v is i mean with hard bound and then the weird west game coming out like i have every assumption that that is going to be good like very good oh, based yeah. on it... um so i get I wanting to like i can't do... talk about it but yes yeah you yeah. were you were a stretch goal on that or yeah, were you a contributor big, i wrote a big i wrote a big kind of um setting for it okay um, I remember your name on that Kickstarter. Um, yes, it was awesome. Great fun. Yeah. Um, like, I totally get wanting to give Spivey money for oh, yeah. something. Um, yeah. Who else comes to mind? What other titles or ideas? Like, if you don't want to drop a name, like, is there... No, 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 it's fine. I mean, in all honesty, I would just spend the money on Samurai and Ken Height, All the money. Okay. And just go, we're doing annotated horror books until the end of time. <laughs> Um, because, you know, we did the King Yellow annotated sure. with Sam's art and Ken did all the annotations that were just amazingly cool. And the book just came out gorgeous. Shane did a great job of kind of, and, and I want to do Dracula. I want to do Lovecraft. I want to do Poe. I, I want to do, hate to you tell know, you, Arthur, Ken's already done Dracula annotated. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, Arthur, Arthur Mockin and, you know, there, there's so many titles that could just mm-hmm. fit in there. Um, that would be a lot of the money. And then, you know, there, there, there's, I'd love to get the band back together. I'd love to get John and Scott more centrally involved with Delta Green. They, they both have kind of come back and done things. Um, and John, of course, is, is over at D&D now. Yeah, um, he's, what, doing video game stuff for them or something? He runs all their videos. So okay. it's crazy. Like, 
old old friends now run Dungeons and Dragons. So I can like, I'm gonna call Ray Winninger like Ray. We're gonna ditch the D20, right? Just get rid of the D20. Um, and they're just great guys. So I'm really happy, and and they have the right idea. Ray has been working on D and D since forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've read Dragon, his articles were in there for decades. Yeah. So really excited to see what they come up with. But yeah, I mean, I I would most likely just um, go around Gen Con do the standard walk and talk, find the people who are, I mean, this is literally how I met Spivey. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of like we wandered into each other and started talking. Yeah. Those, those are the best, you know, in you too. These are the best moments of, of those conventions for me. Yeah. It's these kind of magic moments where you meet somebody who you kind of only knew as a name or you didn't know at all. And you're just kind of like, holy crap, you know, we have a lot in common and you're working on cool stuff. How can I, help you work on cool stuff this is i was literally i would do that shark tank style and just hand out money um I, I think that would be uh, hilarious and i don't know it'd like uh there'd be a lot of tears um <laughs> yes. but okay. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with tears. yeah um i think I, I would be absolutely down if that got turned into like a ticketed event <laughs> well, well we'll see i'll see what i can do about suddenly coming into a lot of money yeah start uh start asking pete adkins if he wants to be part of that <laughs> um okay cool now i'm really excited for a day when that might actually be real um, oh i don't know <laughs> uh crap what the hell do i want to ask i still have a, this has been such a short one um anything man uh, yeah I'm, I'm open um Fleeing the United States, a oh, prescient yeah. move. Yeah. Yes. Um, what is the hobby like where you are? Is there one? Uh, yeah, there, there are stores, but they won't be there long. Uh, you know, truth be told, I, I'm expecting an apocalypse of small stores. Mm -hmm. You know, over the next 20 months, we're going to lose 90% or 95% of all those stores. Restaurants, game stores, comic stores. The comic stuff's already hit. You know, mm -hmm. my friends in comics are already freaking out. Mm -hmm. um, the the situation with Diamond is bad. Yeah, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And um, so this is this is a kind of a golden example of that story. So so um, Wizards Attic paranoid us so mm -hmm. we became so paranoid over that that Shane, in his infinite wisdom, refused to house with any one distributor. And, and Diamond, uh, oh, well, Alliance, mm -hmm. he, he basically just said, no, like, you can't sit on all of our product. We'll just sell you some from time to time. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Thank God he did. We, we, we could have ended up with all of our product in the warehouse not being shipped. Not yeah. being paid. Oh, my God. So, yeah, dodged it. It's like that Bugs Bunny cartoon where the guy throws, like, 19 knives at Bugs Bunny, and he's like this, and suddenly they're just not hitting him. Yeah. That's exactly what this whole thing has been to our dream. We, we somehow miraculously stepped through it. Yeah. I mean, and dying. there are companies that I think uh, people in the what the user base, right? The fans of the hobby, people, the end user of the product. Um, yeah. I think they don't realize that, right? They It just never even occurs to them, but there are companies that we think of as integral yeah. to the shape of the business right now that like inside of 18 months might be gone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, the closer your the company's relationship directly to their fans, the more safe mm -hmm. the, the company is. Um, but having said that, um, there there is a hobby here. Um, I, I there's a great store called Curious Comics on the okay. island. There are two of them, um, and they're just really nice people. They're classically Canadian people in so much as they're like. Uh, you know, would you like to come to our convention and maybe sell some artwork, you know? And then, you know, the second year it was like, we're doing a fundraiser for a kid. You know, do you think you can do something for it? So I painted a Magic the Gathering mat for them and they sold it. And we sent the kid to Hawaii. It was awesome. And, it, you know, it wasn't one of these scams where the company keeps the money or yeah. they actually did what they said they were going to do. And it was so that the year after that, it did another painting. for You know, so there's some great people on the island. Um, there are a couple freelancers here and there okay. um some guys who worked on some white bull stuff down in victoria okay. you know i won't name names sure. but we've met up and talked um but mostly these days i play on roll 20 almost exclusively what what do you play i mean so you said you've been playing 5e for years 
So yeah, so D and D five E is the main to do, and that's with my high school Dungeons and Dragons group. Okay, so it's, it's the guys from eighty four to eighty nine. <laughs> Um, you know, and they're, they're all over the place in North Carolina and Washington, they're in Arizona, sure. they're in Minnesota, and we just get together once a week and play and just have a great time. Um, it's been great fun. I love what they did with 5e and really have a fun time with it. Um, and is that all that you're playing or the lion's share? No, playing? no, that's, that's once a week. That's pretty standard. Sure. Like Bob's saying, oh, we're having a meeting today. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, then um, I run Call, uh, Call Cthulhu, I run um, Delta Green, I run, um, what else did I run? I ran a Godlike game, I ran a Wild Talents game. Um, mostly Delta Green and 5e would be okay. 99% of what I run. Sure. Makes sense. So. <laughs> uh, the world's biggest game and your biggest game. <laughs> yeah. Um, my game. Yeah. Um, which COC do you run? Um, well, I run, uh, I ran Mask of Neural Thotep when it came out again. Okay. For um, seventy, uh, no. Okay. No, I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I, I can't get past Call of Cthulhu Fifth Edition. I just can't. Okay. Fifth Edition is is Call of Cthulhu to me. Um, you know, I love Chaosium, and I, I think they're they're a great company, and all the people there are very talented. It's just um, Fifth Edition is forever locked in my mind as the edition. Is that where you started? No. Okay. No, I started. I started in 1985. Okay. So the cover. The cover was the really dark. Uh, yeah. Face of Cthulhu with the golden eye cover. I think that's third edition. Yeah, third edition. Yeah. So yeah, I bought. I bought that at uh, out of the back of Dragon Magazine. Uh, you know, I sent money away and I got that. Um, and then we played Mask of Meryl Thotep in '86. Okay. And I was. I was in. I, yeah. This was it. Um, so I re, I re, I ran the new Mask of Neural Thotep with the fifth edition rules. Gotcha. We had a great time. Yeah, I mean it, the the update to that product, rule set aside, is uh, exceptional. Um, oh yeah, I loved it. I loved how deep it went. Yeah. You you pull back a curtain and there are three other curtains. That's, yeah. Yeah, I love that. And if I, you... I, I I know to Tio, I, I knew to Tio, and he's just a great guy. Yeah. If you if you ever come into a good amount of money, the uh. HP Lovecraft Historical Society, if I'm getting the name right, yeah. has like this thousand dollar box set of like props and stuff, which is incredible. Yeah, that's Andrew Lehman and those guys. Yeah, they're they're, they're awesome. Um, they, they make amazing stuff. Yeah, I, I have only if only every game could be so lucky as to have people making like high end props for their shit. Um, oh, they're, they're, yeah, they're incredible. Like uh, one year, what did they show us? Oh, here are the wax tablets of Doctor John D. And they have meticulously made. You know these stamped wax tablets with thousands of patterns kind of built into. Oh, they were gorgeous. They yeah. looked totally real. And he's like, "It's not completely real. They're about a quarter inch too thick, and it's because I can't get the mold to set." And I'm just like, "I don't think you need to worry about it." Yeah. Either. You know. You're not. You're not trying to like pass these off at a Christie's <laughs> auction. <laughs> he's trying to like... sell them to the British Museum. Yeah. It, he would have a shot. Yeah. Like, it would be. You'd need to pull in the right person to notice that. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, they would constantly come by, you know, Columbia or Origins Awards or mm -hmm. something. You're like, oh, look at the sacrificial knife I made. And just, oh my God, you know. How did you get that in yeah. here? Just incredible. <laughs> yeah, how'd you get that on the plane? Yeah. Security and Origins is awful. <laughs> God. Uh, <laughs> I love that stuff, though. Um, okay. Uh I have a minimum amount of an hour for any interview, so I'm like trying to think how the hell do I make this the most interesting remaining. Man, just, just ask me anything. I don't know. I'm blanking. As I said in the tweet that I promoted this, there's like only so much before my brain is just gonna shut the fuck off. No. Um, no, no. Vancy and magic or mythos magic? Ah, mythos magic. Bye okay. Yeah. Um. Does Mythos Magic work in D and D? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the five E game I'm running right now is very magic. It's very when when you get a spell, it's you have no idea what it is. It could literally be an old woman cutting a chicken's neck, and it does nothing, and you pay her fifteen gold, and she's like, "You're healed." Okay. Or you know, or you know, it's it's called the uh, you know the internal workings. You know, some dark mm -hmm. evil name. And you go, and it's a magic missile. Like, that, 
So sure. I've kind of built in this lore and de- demonology and hierarchy of powers and calling to the powers and all. So it's very, um, it's very classical Enochian magic sure. kind of overlay uh, and then weirdness. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I would love a game where it's straight up, I can learn shriveling, and, but it destroys my mind. And, sure. Yeah. You know, lose I a want... point of int for every casting <laughs> or something. Yeah. 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 I really want that. And uh, I, I loved having those fights about magic and Delta Green. They're like, how is this balanced? And I'm like, because you die. Yeah, it's not. The... Like, <laughs> that's the entire point. Yeah. It's like giving an ant a flamethrower. Yeah. Like, What's, the ant's going to get cooked, yeah, you but can, he's going to have a great time. Yeah, you're going to mess up all the termites, but right. like, it's going to be Just real bad. Over. Yeah. Um... So, so yeah, I love that. Kind of, I love putting like overpowered doodads in the hands of players and then going, I, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to rule on it. You just go have fun. Do what you want to do. Because it always leads to cool stuff. So, okay, now I have now I have a question, like a real <laughs> okay. one. Um, you've dropped D, you've dropped Enochian. Um, I know from past conversations with you that there are fans of Delta Green and people who work on it who uh, have kind of, let's say, expert knowledge in certain domains, people you go to to fact-check things or pull sure. in inspirations, got people who know the government, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Yeah. So much magic in RPGs is, is uh, all magic in a sense is kind of bullshit, right? right. Um, but there's historically grounded, and then there's like some dude in the 1940s wrote a spec fuck story, and we've just built it off that. Um, right. Is it is it something that you do? Is it something that somebody else does that puts a grounding to it? No, I, I, I read a ton on that stuff. Okay. Uh, so, so I have a personal obsession and a collection of books um, that I kind of obsess over, but not in any, not in any, like, I'm casting a spell. To sure, yeah. Um, I, you know, You're sometimes not, like, cutting your hand as you read yeah, it. No, um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not invoking the fifth circle okay. and stepping into the void. Um, but I'm reading books on that a lot. Uh, so, for example, in the new King Yellow book I'm working on, mm-hmm called impossible landscapes you know we refer to real books of magic um and this is this is kind of a dual-sided joke um because it's about a book that unravels reality the the, the entire game um and then you find out kind of that the book is real but the reality may not be very real and later on you know so i wanted to build in this kind of unraveling device in the game Um, so i looked very deeply at real existing demonology um, that predates the modern rewrites that sure. you might put yeah. in. <laughs> the kind of like, hey, Carl, you want to make 60 bucks? Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. demonology book. Uh, <laughs> so these these go back to like the Black Poets and sure. th- things like that. Um, and I really wanted to make that kind of fit and feel right. And um, it just led me down some really weird corridors that, and I, I, it was really nice because I got to creep myself out a lot, which mm-hmm. is always a really, that's kind of like 50% of why I'm writing any Delta Green thing is like, where's the moment I'm going to feel bad being alone in a room writing this um, or kind of creeped out or wake up in the middle of the night, think about that thing. Um, so I love that stuff. Um, I'll always try and refer it back to the real. And that's kind of the, when I say the real, I mean, sure. book that exists. The historical. The yeah. Yes. Um, and Delta Green is all about that. And, and the core of the Delta Green experience, I will say is the, the, it's about the obvious historical. Yeah. It, it, it can never be, well, Cthulhu killed Kennedy. And then, you know, and, and literally we've gotten letter upon letter saying, why didn't the Migo kill, you know, like, and it's just like, now, that. now I really got to run a 1960s Delta Green game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where... Well, I, I, when we talked with Ken and he wrote that book, he nailed the tone. Mm-hmm. And th- that tone is, well, you know, we'll conquer poverty and we'll conquer vietnam and we'll conquer these goddamn alien bastards too no problem yeah you know and then it all goes to hell and like yeah i loved it i love that that tone the mcnamara kind yeah. of we're gonna do this and... oh mcnamara <laughs> oh what a piece of shit <laughs> I, know, um, I know if if only he didn't star in one of my favorite documentaries uh fog of war yeah hell yeah it's just an exceptional documentary and and it's so it's not a self-serving interview, which 
I love. Yeah. He kind of humiliates himself several times and yeah. he kind of knows it. Uh, yeah, um, great, great movie. Yeah, probably. I mean, definitely my favorite film that stars McNamara, but probably <laughs> also my favorite film from that director. Um, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Also, fun fact in that documentary that uh, Curtis LeMay wants to drop the A-bomb on Korea. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. At the end no. of the Korean War, he's just like, but we have the bomb. Yeah. Why don't we no, just I drop mean, it? There, were, there, there was actual consideration of that, and LeMay was just kind of like, it's just larger ordnance, yeah. I think was the quote. Yeah. It's, just, it's a bigger bomb. Yeah. That's all it is. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Oh man, that would have been a very weird future. Yeah, they they, they do that in Wild Talents. They, they 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 drop it on a mountain in between North and South Korea. They just level the mountain. They take the top off, and China just goes back to China, and that's the end of the Korean conflict. <laughs> um, how much how much of your writing process, or not just writing, right, art? generally yeah. um is just you kind of following yourself down into a hole like that it's all that okay um i you know there's no uh you know i read i read a lot about artists um and writers who have these deep rituals for preparation and such mm -hmm. and I, I, while i can appreciate why that must be so for some people um i've always been in the stephen king camp myself which is just kind of like just go make something and if it sucks, it sucks. Just knowing when it sucks is kind of the important bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but trying to make something every day um, is kind of the key. And when I paint, or I literally will just scribble something. I'll scribble another thing. I'll scribble another thing and then go, oh, that's the one I'm going to paint. And then paint it. Was that always true for you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the writing stuff in the beginning, um, I found I could... Um, I could do like a decent imitation of a game book just unconsciously. Okay. Or I was just kind of like, blah, 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 yeah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 you know, and changing the info. And, and sure. then I was like, this isn't good enough. Like it's, you know, it's, it's kind of rote. And then I started getting, like, I think the first real significant thing I wrote was the section on the fate. Okay. Uh, yeah. Where I, where I really tried to kind of make you emote. Like I want, I wanted the text to make you feel something. Sure. Uh, which was kind of loneliness and weirdness and urban spaces kind mm -hmm. of general feeling. Um, it's from the original Delta Green book. Yeah. Um, and that was the first thing I can re remember kind of churning out and going like, Hey, that's a piece of writing. I'm actually pretty happy with. Um, and later on I hated it. And, you know, it's, as it goes, you know, um, I will but, say yeah. I've always loved the fate and I want, I, I know the fate is done. But there is a part of me that always hopes the fate makes a reappearance. It was the first time in an RPG that I remembered being like, "Oh shit, this takes place in New York." I could walk to where this supposedly takes yeah. place. Oh, oh yeah, um, yeah. That was a yeah. that was a formative moment where I was like, "Oh, this." Even even knowing DG before that point, I was like, "Yes, yeah, the real world, but like it's somewhere else." Um, yeah, yeah. The re the realization that like I could hop on the train. Yeah, go there. Mm -hmm. Um. I think yeah. made me maybe realize you could ground things in reality in a way that like nothing else. Magic wasn't that. D and D wasn't that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, John and John really kind of led the way on that. John really just kind of was like, "What? What if everything was, you know, deeply fucked all the time? Like, yeah. It wasn't about saving the world. It was about not, not." dying moment to moment and and then just occasionally shutting doors that will be open at some later date yeah and all right he set that tone and, and scott really ran with it in kind of historical stuff and i became obsessed with the ufo stuff mm -hmm. and then the fate the fate was my high school call Cthulhu group really yeah so i ran Stephen lz's and all those guys i invented all those guys for my high school call Cthulhu group to oh. face um before there was a delta Green. they yeah, were yeah. They were they were a group of investigators from like Miskatonic or something like that. Okay. And and it you know Club Apocalypse mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff was all just there. Um, so when they saw that in print, that was awesome. Like I, yeah, I can't really imagine what that'd be like. Yeah, they were they were like that fucker escaped again. Yeah. Like because they they killed him like three times at that point. It's like well now he's canonically <laughs> in a published book, so yeah, yeah. he did. He uh, won. <laughs> Um, that was fun. So going back to like that that idea of just make something every day, right? Yeah. And 
did hmm. was that ever hard oh yeah it's always hard okay um uh, so i mean it was hard for different reasons at different times sure. in new york it was hard because i was gonna starve or be evicted sure continuously and i you know i couldn't paint or draw fast enough to keep myself alive yeah um and you know ended up having three roommates in a you know 750 square foot apartment with a loft in the living room it's totally Sounds normal right. in new york yeah um you know i just couldn't take it anymore um but what 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 what's never hard is um trying something and i think i think many people are very hard on themselves that if they don't get it right immediately they can't do it mm -hmm. and it's just like, you know, my, my, sometimes my son is like that or he's just kind of like, he wants to be, wants to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, he, he just walks away. Yeah. So I, I, I learned very early on that I was not that great, that I'm not going to be this amazing Michael Jordan of RPG design. I'm not going to be this, you know, incredible artist who, you know, sells million dollar canvases. Um, so why worry so much about, what I'm doing. And, and it, I learned it from um, Will Eisner. Will Eisner was a teacher of mine at School of the Arts. And he literally, he said, you're not important. I'm not important. You know, if you don't do the work and we can't review the work, we're never going to know if you're getting any better. So just do the work and, and we'll all look at it and we'll give you an honest answer. And I really took that with me. It really made a moment where it was kind of like, you have to be able to self judge. You have to look at your own work and go, Am I hitting above par? Or am I hitting below par? Is this where I want to be? And 99% of the time it's, nope, you know, you're, you're below it and you just have to kind of put it aside and try the next thing. Um, and sometimes you get in a groove and you get to ride it for a little bit. And, and more and more, the older I get, the bigger the grooves and the longer they run and the deeper they go, or I hope the deeper they go, um, which is a really good thing. Like the last, the King of Yellow book, 160,000 words. Like it was supposed to be, 65,000 words and it just exploded and it just kept going and it go off in this direction and go off in this direction and it just became this thing and now I'm painting it and it's the same thing it's like here are 33 paintings of the guy with the gun on the floor and the same and like I can't do that it's got to be it's got to be a bunch of different paintings um so so I, I think the big the big takeaway for me that I've, I've learned over the years and it took a lot to learn it it was not it was not just one day I went, sure. you know what? I got it. It's really hard is that um, most of you, most of what you create is going to suck in the end. Nobody's really going to remember who you were. Um, try and do your best. Try and make something you can be proud of and, and look back with love on. I, I look at the original Delta green book now, even now. And I go, um, some of the writing in there I did was really bad, but um, I still love it. Mm -hmm. It's together. It's a thing. And, and I can feel that it's this coherent idea. Um, I, you got to fall in love with the art mm -hmm. and, and, and everything else becomes kind of a secondary thing. How I, feel about it. I mean, I like it. I agree. That's okay. You can fight. No, 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 no. It's not a fight. Uh, not, not, <laughs> not, not this time at least. Um, <laughs> I like fights. Uh, I miss same. New York. Me, I miss me New too. York fights. Yeah. Um, just fucking slide the knife in. I smile. Um, <laughs> so I. That's something I've struggled with my entire life. <laughs> um, there are areas of my life that I've overcome it. There are areas of my life that I absolutely have not. Um, yeah. yeah. I wound up in the position I'm in in this business because I never overcame it when I came to games. Oh, you, you, you think you're where you are now because of that? Yeah. I. Well, then, then it served you. But that's the thing, right? But it, it, still, it still is part of – it's something at the back of my mind always, right? If when I was 10, I got more comfortable and just forced myself to write more – I wouldn't have spent every single dollar I had buying every RPG so that I could learn mm -hmm. as much as I possibly could about them so that I could write the perfect game. Um, right. And right. the more no, I the more I read, the more I knew, the more that became the skill I had. Right. Um, right. 
you know, it, it depends on what you are, right? Like mm-hmm. if, if you, you said you're an archivist, you're, you're a collector. That's what I have become, yeah. I, well, I mean, that's that's a thing too, you know? Like I, I like the way I look at all this is, is I see so many people living their lives for other people. And I know I know scant few who are not. And then you're one of the scant few who are not. You, you decided to leave New York. You decided to do this. You decided that that is, for me, that is 99% of it, whether it works out or not. Like, you know, when I moved to Seattle with Pagan, I thought we were in it for the long haul. I thought we were going to be there 10 years later making books, but it wasn't to be. And then when we had to move on, I didn't look back at it as a giant failure. I looked back at it as, well, those guys are still my friends and we made something awesome and it's not the time for it. And, and you know, so I, I admire people who can make those jumps, even if those jumps fail. The jump is the important part, not the success. Fair. Um, so, and occasionally I'll get lucky. I'll get a Magic. I'll get a, I'll get a Vancouver. Um, but uh, you know, New York didn't treat me very well. So um, it doesn't treat most people well. Even <laughs> yeah. even the people you think it treats well, it yeah. really doesn't. Yeah, they're stressed out of their minds. Yeah. You know, I, I totally believe that. Um, but but you know, the, the way I look at it is just. You, you got to live your life for you because you, you holy shit, it's going to be gone real quick. Yeah. Um, and people don't like to think about that. They think, you know, well, I'll just go to school for these three years or I'll just, I'll just work in this job for these 10 years. And holy shit. Yeah. I'm so glad I love video games. It's not even funny. I still think about that. I wake up thinking, am I still in video games? And the answer is no. Holy shit. Thank God. How did that happen? Not, what do you not, mean? So how did you get into it, and then how did you get out of it? Uh, okay, so um, uh, I applied to a whole bunch of places and uh, got some interest from Radical and a couple other places. But the Radical breakthrough moment was I was drawing in a Starbucks in downtown Vancouver. For those at home, downtown Vancouver is Caprica City from Battlestar Black. <laughs> Um, so it looks like it's exactly like that. It's, it's, so I was drawing a comic book page in a Starbucks and a guy came up to me and said, uh, what are you doing? Are you tracing a, a, a photo? It was like very rude. Whatever he said, I said, no, I'm like drawing this for money. And he said, brew. And I said, well, I think it's for dark horse. And he said, oh, hell you do comics. And I said, sometimes and he said, you should come down to radical tomorrow. We're hiring an art director for a game. that's based on a comic. And I said, um, Okay. So the next day I went down to Radical and uh, they were like, so what con- you know, where have you worked for comics? I said, well, I worked at Marvel and DC and here's some of my books. And so I, they're like, we're doing a Hulk game. And I'm like, yeah, I can draw the Hulk. So suddenly I was an art director on this Hulk game or like, like, a, like a senior artist or something like that, I forget. Um, and then two days into that, they had some design thing and I spouted off in a design meeting saying, you should make it so backflips and and they were like how do you know how to do that and i said well i worked on this game magic and i you know, did game design and they're like oh you're a game designer now <laughs> go sit with the game designers so then i was a game designer um and then that i worked at radical for six years five years um and created a prototype for them mm-hmm. um so I, I managed to kind of fight my way up from making a title as a senior designer to shipping a Oh my God! The game Scarface, which mm-hmm. is a horrible game, but it represented. It was the Vietnam of my gaming experience. It was we were parachuted in, they were overrun, we had to kind of take it over. And then um, worked on an unannounced Lord of the Rings game. Um, managed to get Christopher Tolkien to greenlight a Ring Wraith game, and then they canceled the project, um, which was just one of the most awful yeah uh, moments. Um, and then uh, prototype. So I pitched prototype, and me and this guy Eric Holmes kind of created it from scratch and built it and released it in 2009. It did pretty well, and there was a sequel. But I left, um, mostly because I saw mobile was kind of up and coming and um, worked at Hothead Games with Ron Gilbert of mm-hmm. Monk Island fame uh, a couple of his games, and that was great fun. Um, and then I fucked off to San Francisco and ran a bunch of uh, different mobile divisions for... Um, uh, Nickelodeon and Warner Brothers and others. Um, and in the end, Warner Brothers was the last 
Uh, I was the vice president at Warner Brothers, and I ran their mobile division in San Francisco uh, creatively. And um, I managed to get approval and launch their Game of Thrones game, their Harry Potter game, uh, Lego shenanigans. Worked on the Lego MMO forever, which never came out. Yeah. Um, but the Harry Potter thing was the end for me. Uh, it was just a nightmare. Trying to, I had to pitch to Joe Rowling to get Harry Potter approved. She had final approval, mm-hmm. and it was a nightmare and it was horrible. And I was working seventy-hour weeks and never seeing my children and living in a place that bled me dry moment to moment. Even though I was making more money than God, like hey, I had no money and. It's like, how much are we making? And I have no money. Yeah. Like, so I was like, started thinking about escape at that point. Um, and uh, it was a two part plan. I was going to go, I went to work for Hairbrain Schemes. Mm-hmm. We downsized dramatically, uh, got out of all of our mortgage, just bought a house outright in Washington, worked on a game there at Hairbrain Schemes, worked on some of the Shadowrun games, worked on a game called Acropolis, mm-hmm. and then um, had already planned to kind of move up back to Vancouver. Uh, Trump, started kind of banging the drum in July 2015 and I looked took one look at America and said he's going to get elected and we're leaving and my wife said you're crazy her parents said you're crazy my parents said you're crazy uh, we fucked off uh, it took about a year and nine days before the election we landed here with a new house and uh, he got elected and everybody went how did you know yeah. America's fucking stupid yeah yeah I mean, you grew up in New York, right? Was there ever a time Donald Trump was not on the news? No. No. Yeah. I mean, once you identified, like, the actual skill a politician needs to get elected. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just like, uh, this was a conversation I had endlessly with friends of mine where, like, I would, like, spend hours deep into the night just, like, chain smoking and talking to my friends and just being like, no, you don't understand. This is going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. And, you know, yeah, it's my early, one of my earliest memories on television was uh, Rod, Roger Grimsby and Bill Butel on, like, evening news talking about Donald Trump. And it was, like, must have been 1974 or 1975, and he was being sued for some racist bullshit he sure. was doing. Sure, yeah. And, and he was, you know, on the news just yelling at people, and I was just like, I remember thinking as a little kid, I was like four or five, mm-hmm. what a horrible person. Like, he was a monster, basically. Yeah. Even then. So, so I'm really glad we left. And my family's really glad we left. And my wife tells me every day, thank you for doing that because that was the right move and I never would have done that. People don't think things can change and things can change really quick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Usually for the worse, occasionally for the better. Yeah, yeah. Um, But, uh, yeah, I mean, good good move, good planning. Um, Well, you know, I'll keep a wing open for you guys. Please, if if shit goes truly south. Uh, yeah. I found out today that there is a, um, do you, do you know the geographic meaning of the word enclave? No. Okay. So enclave geographically is like, uh, what Vatican city is, right? Uh, oh, okay. Completely so like landlocked. That. It's entirely encompassed by something else. Right. Um, an exclave is something that is very nearly that. So right. if you think of like, uh, some of the weirdest gerrymandering maps or shit like that, Right. Um, I found out today that there is a small island that is technically part of uh, Minnesota that uh, is completely encircled by Canada. Oh, yeah? It's just that there there's a tiny slice of water that maintains it contiguously <laughs> with the United States. Awesome. And that um, nobody watches it at all that in fact if you were if you're going through the border they don't keep a person there you video call (laughs) to the nearest place where they actually keep a person um so if i ever needed to sneak through that's my point of entry yeah yeah. um yeah no i'll put your name on the border you know we'll have a list cool appreciate it well well, yeah it's okay we'll have like a refugee center for games I, I, you could, I mean, given the photos I've seen of your house, I kind of believe you have the space. <laughs> so we, we may already have it. We don't know. Yeah. We haven't searched the whole house recently. It's fair. There's just like like tiny little game designers hiding in your it attic. Takes, takes a couple days. Yeah. Nancy is somewhere here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. No, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's depressing and it's really hard to watch news from the South and talk to my family there and talk to my friends there. And, you know, it's a bummer. Yeah. It's, uh, 
in a sense, I mean, this is this is going to be the most fucked up thing I've said yet on one of these interviews. <laughs> um, uh, the whole virus situation has been delightful because now I have more than one place where my own government is trying to kill me. <laughs> um, yeah, it's crazy. Now we, it's... We, we just don't understand it. Like, yeah. Canada is the exact inversion. Like, they're literally like, are you put out of work? Here's two thousand dollars. Is your wife out of work? Here's two thousand mm-hmm. dollars. When do you stop payments? Four months, but we'll vote again in case the crisis is still going on. Yeah. And the province gonna pay you a thousand dollars each. And if you have two children, that's nine hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. And it's like, this is too much money, Canada. You should take some of this back. Yeah. Like, and they're like, no, no, no. You need to take care of those it's, kids. That's you know? fine. Yeah. You're it's, you're it's doing totally, the work. It's totally yeah. fucked up. It's like, well, coming. I I had to. It took me three years to be deprogrammed from the states like where it's kind of like the government's not supposed to do anything Mm -hmm. like it's supposed to be negative Mm -hmm. whatever it does is supposed to be bad for you and so whenever they were doing something good here i'd get really nervous for about two years did i did i misunderstand this like actual like they're like it's free money for everybody and it's like oh shit is free money bad like if the government's doing it free money has to be bad are they gonna track me yeah like See, am I? Do I owe them that much time? It's just in like my a life? like a classic like cartoon trap of like there's just like a stack of money and you like trap you under a box. It really, it really um, felt like the the best example I had was uh, the payment. You to have medical here is a very small payment. Mm-hmm. When I first moved here, it was a hundred dollar, one hundred ninety dollars a year. Or and they said, "Oh, we're changing the MSP payments," and I was like getting a sign out. I was going to protest, and it's like now it's zero. <laughs> what like how does that work how are you screwing me i don't see it yeah i was getting really uncomfortable and then i realized like maybe they're just not they're not yeah um i so i did undergrad in canada and uh was an idiot um and hurt myself a lot and like had to have my stomach pumped a bunch and like all these things that like would have cost me thousands and thousands of dollars nothing Uh, nothing. just like i just didn't even think about it just be like oh yeah i have to go to the hospital Oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's it's a very it's a very different place. Like the the two major differences are that the medical is exceptionally well done mm-hmm. in my experience. I've had life life saving procedures done here. They've been better than elsewhere. And then the police. Mm-hmm. The police are actually there to de escalate things, and, it, and it's a very uncomfortable feeling when you come from New York or like I don't know Just how like many... anywhere in the U.S. Honestly, yeah, like yeah, like but in New York, like. For me, New York got really weird after, like, when the when the whole Giuliani spin up of like yeah. the Roman police force yeah. became a thing. Like, there's and a I was guy like, on every corner. There's a guy on every corner, and he has an M4. Right, um, right, right. And they're radioing ahead, so you like you run down the block. There's like 30 cops waiting for you. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it always was being kind of escalated. Mm-hmm. No matter what you do, you can literally hold your hands up and go like, you know, and they're like, well, you got a problem? Like, yeah. you know, and in Canada, they're just kind of like, they like wave you down, you stop your car, you're like, oh, fuck. And the guy's like, your light's out, you know, and you can go, like if you go up to the, the, the little shop down there, and my brother works there and he'll give you a deal on the light. And you're just like, where am I? Like, yeah. um, but it's, it's a beautiful thing. I love it. All right. Um... I'm I'm glad to hear you're doing well. Yeah, well, so so few people right now are, and honestly, like, not no sarcasm, no, no, like, no, 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 I, no I, like, I, I'm genuinely no. glad to hear you're doing well. No, I, I get it. I feel bad, you know. Like, I know a lot of my like Shane is trapped in Alabama, and I'm trying to get him out. He's applying. He's you know he's almost through applications for Canada. We'd love to move our dream up here and mm-hmm. you know, come here, but he's literally surrounded by you know president trump fans yeah um and and his family is in no way shape or form a fan of president trump yeah. so and there no one's wearing masks everybody's just out doing the like it's all just kind of stopped i mean somehow. hell i'm i'm in what is considered a relatively liberal bastion of austin and nobody's wearing masks that's just crazy to me yeah like, bar, bars full restaurants full right. um people out jogging large right. groups of people walking dogs together right next Do they to each not, other they not understand what's going on like, i just don't I, I don't know i have no idea i, I, I really I told, don't i told this to my dad my dad was very reticent to follow the rules in the beginning and i said you may have noticed the world economy has crashed yeah 
that's a decent indicator that this is serious. Maybe you should take it seriously. And he was like, huh, I'm going to take that under consideration. I, I had that conversation with my dad where he, my dad was just like, just be safe ish. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? And he was like, you know, like this will be over in like a couple of weeks. And I'll be like, no, no. no. Like, and, like, a few days later, like, the stock market had, like, fully plummeted. And he was like, so you might actually be right about this thing. Um, and I was like, yeah, no shit. Um, yeah, yeah, I got to say, the nihilists are really running away with this game. Like, yeah. I, I, every time I speak to any of my family members, I'm like, you know what's going to happen in about three weeks? And I just pick the worst thing that mm-hmm. can possibly happen. And it happens. It happens. Like, How the fuck did you know every that? Every time. I'm like. Just because it's the worst thing I can imagine. So, of yeah, course, yeah. it would. Yeah, I'm sure there's something worse, but I'm yeah. I'm, I'm I'm trying real hard. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the there's something worse. I'm just not clever enough. Yeah, and that's really, exactly you're right. lucky that I'm not clever yeah. enough. No, I mean, next up is the big outbreak in the states in September, October, and then the canceling of the election. Yeah, or the nullification of the results, where he says people cheated in the mail-ins. Yeah, and, yeah. It's that's coming. that's my that's my bet. Um, yeah, the big thing I've been wondering. And I'm not wondering, I think this is exactly what's going to happen, is uh, the cycle of infection is just going to keep repeating itself. Oh, and, yeah. And it's going to be cities to non-cities yep. just going through waves of who has it under control. Yep, and they're refusing to close again, and all the businesses are going to force, you know, put these people in these awful decisions where it's like lose your job in, in like a complete depression economy mm-hmm. or go back to work and die. Yeah. Like, those are your choices. If, uh, if we like, fire you... There's somebody else who will take it. Oh, seriously, there's thousands of people waiting for that job. Thirty yeah. percent unemployment. Yeah, it's it's fucking crazy. Um, so you know, I, I look at that and I just think this is the worst young adult novel ever. Like someone someone out there, Shane or whatever the kid's name is, is living some weird life on the edge of some scientific research laboratory right now. We're on page ninety eight. Isn't that a uh... That was like a t- one of the Twilight Zone movie stories. It's the kid who just like made the TV shit real. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah. He wishes it into the cornfield. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I it's know. it's uh it's that writ large. Yeah, it feels like that, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um well, assuming neither of us die, uh at some point in the future or when conventions happen again, if they ever do. Um I'll uh, I'm hopeful. Yeah, me too. Uh, I'm hopeful. I'm also a nihilist, so like, yeah, yeah, for yeah, for yeah. me, hope is like we only lose like I don't know twenty percent of the world pop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be that bad. So uh, that's that's a win in terms of how bad it could go. Um, yeah. So assuming assuming that only one uh, assuming that only one in five dies, uh, and it's neither of us. Uh, I'll, I'll buy you a, a meal at Gen Con sometime. Yes. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I'm hopeful it won't be this Gen Con, but next Gen Con, maybe. Maybe. Pro- probably later than that. But yeah. We'll see. I'll take it. But it, it's great to talk to you. Likewise, man. Yeah, it's always fun. And uh, I did. I honestly didn't know you were that young. I'm really. Now I feel guilty. I am thirty. Oh my god! You don't look thirty. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> now that must have come in handy, actually. Uh, yeah. yeah. I. Uh... I was the designated liquor buyer in high school <laughs> because I already had gray hair and could grow a mustache and beard um, and wore like military surplus clothes. So like everyone right. thought I was just like a small homeless man, um, right. just like a small Vietnam vet who was just like, wow. Where, where did you buy, where did you buy the alcohol? Uh, a liquor store on second Avenue and 93rd street. Okay. I, I don't know. I'm not sure I know that. I was just thinking the other day, um, do you know Starrett City out, out on... Yeah. It's like the death capital of the world. Mm-hmm. I used to work at the Associated there. The, Damn. The, the, like, like, you know that Associated yeah. Foods? Like, so they used to stack stuff there, but I just read, like I saw this map of like death, mm-hmm. concentration. Everything's like gray and red and Starrett City's this deep, deep purple and it's like 700 plus or something. And I was just like, Oh my god! <laughs> and I spent weeks, months, just being there and hanging out there. And, oh, yep. It's crazy. Like all, I can't connect all this shit. Nine Eleven was like this to me too. I was in Seattle, and it was like, who was in the building? Oh, you know, uh, you know, so and so was in the building. It's like holy shit, you know, mm-hmm. like a high school guy. Yeah. And we ended up losing a bunch of guys, but 
you could see the world changing. This feels very similar to that. Yeah, real time. Watching, yeah, yeah. watching like the rest of the world clue in at a oh. delay. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Italy and you know, like two weeks before in Italy, people walking around and filming stuff. Yeah. Then yeah. it's like death zone. Yeah. Um, I have a good friend who did high school and elementary school friend did logistics and was living in Burundi in Africa and like basically like one day they were like oh it's fine and the next day they were like uh so we've chartered a plane if you don't get out of the country by tomorrow um you're on your own uh you can you can go to Hong Kong or you can go to Paris and from there we'll hopefully be able to figure out a way to get you back to wherever you need to go um and so he was like trapped in france for a while and like finally caught the last plane out of france back to the u.s Um, sounds like it's like 28 days late basically yeah man crazy so yeah well um yeah and if this ever clears up you know bring your partner bring your dog come on out come visit the, the wayward home it would be great designers is there uh is there any way to get to you other than by plane yeah, you can take the ferry. Okay, cool. My dog would not do well on a plane. The plane is kind of, the plane is kind of awesome. I like, know, but also it, my dog would probably rip the throat out of the pilot out of fear, <laughs> um, just to just to be like she'd be like I'm if I'm on the ground it's fine I don't care if I'm dead I'm on the ground. How, how would she? It's a she. Yeah. How would she do with like seals? That's a very good question. She yeah. she hates most animals that aren't human loves all humans um but there's a chance that she just like won't understand what it is and just like yeah, with, our dog is like that too yeah like, rabbits are completely invisible to him but he will hunt rats and yeah food. basically like squirrels cats even other yeah. dogs not a fan yeah. but like yeah. there are things where she's just like i, I don't know what you like i'm gonna just I'm, <laughs> if you come at me okay but like if you stay yeah. on the other side of the street gonna... we're good I'm going to classify you as a plant. Basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you are a large bird. Cool. We're good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be out. Um, oh, that's funny. What kind of dog is it? She is a pit and hound mix. Oh, yeah. Um, I really, we have no idea. She was, she, she was a rescue from Let's an see. ASPCA shelter. Uh, she, we assume she was a fight dog, and she's definitely right. had kids. Um but she was also like in the shelter for four months because she was part of an active police investigation. So like they couldn't even let her be adopted until like the day we got her. Um, That's that's a, that's a good story. That's a good outcome. Yeah. Um, So things turned out okay for her. She has like a lot of trauma, but she's like, she's good with people. Um, Day one, a child poked her in the eye and she was just like, and then just like went in for like pets and was just like totally fine um like all people are her friends uh oh that's good but other animals it's a little dicey if you're a fight dog that makes sense yeah well Um, hang in there and likewise let me know whenever uh your things clear up where you are or you have to flee yeah dude either way high sign either way i'll dm you (laughs) <laughs> oh man but it's great to talk to you likewise cool all right see you later